This morning, I'm bringing a message that has really, it's really burned in me since, since starting, starting off. It actually isn't the message I intended to write at all in any way, shape or form. Um, but I haven't been able to shake this. I really feel God wants to say something today. And I feel a great sense of responsibility to present this to you with as much clarity as I can. This is a message about our nation and our culture, but it's also about and to the church. And in many ways, this message might be a bit of a lament. Um, I'm not going to apologize for that, because sometimes that's what we need. And it's not a lament without hope. I believe we're being called to repent. And I believe when we turn, the situation will change. You see, our nation is in a desperate state, but so is the Western Church. For too long, the church has been putting the blame for the state of our nation on our politicians and our leaders, for the way our nation's moved away from God, but we're looking in the wrong place. We do not have a weak church because our nation is corrupted. Our nation is corrupted because we have a weak church. A church that has compromised its commitment, its values, and its reverence and passion for Jesus. And it's very easy when talking about this to think we're talking about them. About other churches that are getting it wrong. Or other people in the room even. And the state that they're in. But you know what? That's just transference. It's the easy option when you hear a message that the church needs to repent to put it on other people. I'd ask this morning that we don't do that. This is about the nation, this is about the church as a whole, but I would ask that each of us in the room make this personal. Make this about us. Don't think of other people as you hear this today, but challenge yourself challenge your own heart and your own attitudes this is not a message where we can get to the end of it and be pleased somebody else has had a reality check and I know that's easy to do I've done that where you sit and you listen and you think I hope in certain name here heard that also before we start I want us to understand something there is a difference between condemning and convicting those two things are very different. But the trouble is, is we can misunderstand them. God did not send his son to condemn the world, but to save it. Jesus also said when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin. We know as Christians there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ, but there should be conviction. But here's what we do. When conviction comes, if it's hard conviction, we can brush it off as condemnation and not listen to it. If you think you're getting condemned, you'll switch off. If you take it as conviction, you'll take it on board and you'll do something about it. So I want to ask, this is not to condemn, this is to convict. Please take it as that. Condemning puts us down. Convicting sets us free. God wants to speak into this state we're in, and he wants to say something from the book of Malachi. And we're going to be looking at Malachi chapter 1. Um, but before we get to it, just a little bit of background on it for you. If you're not familiar with the book of Malachi, when Malachi was written, Edom, the nation of, his, of Esau, had just recently fallen. Israel was in an extremely bad state at this time. They had corrupt priests, and there was a deep lack in the people, particularly in the area of tithes, although that in itself was a symptom of a bigger problem. And God spoke to Israel through Malachi, and it would be mild to say that God was angry. God was so angry that after this book, it would be 400 years before he'd speak again. 
There's an interesting thing to note here. There is more of God speaking in this book than any of the other prophetic books. Over 55, sorry, of its 55 verses, 47, that's 85%, are direct words of God. That makes this a book worthy of our attention. So what happened is Israel had come back into the land. They'd been in exile and they'd come back. Nehemiah had rebuilt the walls, but Jerusalem was not in a good state. The temple was rebuilt, but it was small compared to Solomon's. And the presence of God that used to rest in the temple was no longer there. The palace had been rebuilt, but there was no king to put in it. See, the nation had been rebuilt, but spiritually it was empty. And the people were disillusioned. And as often happens in these cases, they'd grown cold to God. See, when they were in their exile, Israel learned their lesson about idols. Israel would never again return to foreign gods, which you'd think would be good news. But no, instead of foreign gods, they found religion. They'd got formal about God. Their hearts were not in it. Even if they were doing all of the external stuff, and if you were just to look at them, you'd think they were being holy. They were asking, what is the bare minimum I can do and get by on giving to God? In my time, in my attention, and in my money. God was not a priority in their lives at all. And the priests, they were just like the people. They weren't really bothered about how many people turned up, just as long as they got through it and got paid. If they could draw a good crowd by giving them life lessons, then that's great. But don't challenge them or they won't come. Services were done in a casual and careless way and they were not giving God anything like their best. The attitude of the people when it came to serving God was, let's just get through this and go home. I've got more important things to do. I think as we'll see as we read on, the parallels with the Western Church today are staggering. Now as I read this, I'm using the message um, for this first read through. Now it's rare for me to use the message, I don't usually use it, um, but the language in the message here is vivid. Some parts of the message actually have been updated in a way that doesn't reflect the original context, and I'll pick up those as we go. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the message, by the way, it's a strange old book, the message. It's not a translation of the Bible. It's not even a paraphrase of the Bible. It's the work of a guy called Eugene Peterson, who, and it's like a rewriting of the Bible in an attempt to make it more understandable to people who don't know it. And that's a good thing, but you can't treat it as a real Bible. Does that make sense? You can't study with it. So it's not scripture, really, but that doesn't mean it's not helpful. And sometimes it can help us to explain things, and God can speak to us through it. As we go on, I will compare it to some other versions, but when we actually get into the bulk of the message, um, Oh, sorry, the bulk of the sermon. That'll get confusing. When we get into the bulk of the sermon, I'll not be using the message. I'll be using the English Standard Version. But this first read through, I'm going to use the message. So you probably don't want to follow along because this is going to confuse you if you do. Malachi 1, verses 1 to 14. God has said, I love you. You replied, really? How have you loved us? Look at history. This is God's answer. Look at how differently I've treated you from Jacob, from Esau. Sorry, treated you, Jacob, from Esau. I loved Jacob and hated Esau. I reduced pretentious Esau to a molehill, turned his whole country into a ghost town. 
When Edom, Esau, said, we've been knocked down, but we'll get up. We'll start over, good as new. God of the angel armies. Now, God of the angel armies is, and the other version says, Lords of ho Lord of hosts, means the same thing. God of the angel armies said, just try it and see how far you get. When I knock you down, you stay down. People will look one day and say, land of evil and the God-cursed tribe. Yes, take a good look. Then you'll see how faithfully I've loved you. And you'll want even more, saying, may God even be greater beyond the borders of Israel. Isn't it true that a son honors his father and a worker his master? So if I'm your father... Where's the honor? If I'm your master, where's the respect? Now some versions say fear. Where's the fear? God of the angel armies is calling you to the carpet. You priests despise me. You say, not so. How do we despise you? By your shoddy, sloppy, defiling worship. You ask, what do you mean defiling? What's defiling about it? When you say the altar of God is not important anymore, worship of God is no longer a priority, that is defiling. When you offer worthless animals for sacrifices and worship, animals that you're trying to get rid of, blind and sick and crippled animals, isn't that defiling? Try a trick like that with your banker or your senator. In the correct text, governor. How far do you think that will get you? God of the angel armies asks you. Get on your knees and pray that I will be gracious to you. You priests have gotten everyone into trouble with this kind of conduct. Do you think I'll pay attention to you? God of the angel armies asks you. Why doesn't one of you just shut the temple doors and lock them? then none of you can get in and play religion with this silly, empty-headed worship. I am not pleased. The God of the angel armies is not pleased. And I don't want any more of this so-called worship. I am honored all over the world. There are people who know how to worship me all over the world. By the way, this bit's in the wrong tense. It says will be, but looking back, makes sense, who honor me by bringing their best to me. They're saying it everywhere, God is greater, this God of the angel armies. All except you. Instead of honoring me, you profane me. You profane me when you say worship is not important and what you bring to worship is of no account. Uh, and when you say, I'm bored, this does nothing for me, you act so superior sticking your noses in the air. Act superior to me, God of the angel armies. And when you do something for me, it's hand-me-down, broken, useless. Do you think I'm going to accept it? This is God speaking to you. A curse on the person who makes a big show of doing something great for me an expensive sacrifice here, and then at the last minute bring something puny and worthless. I am a great God, God of the angel armies, honored far and wide, and I'll not put up with it. It's harsh. It's blunt. But if you approach that passage with the right attitude, extremely challenging. I'd like to consider some thoughts that I believe directly apply to our nation and to the church today. Again, as I say this, this is not about somebody else. Don't look at others. Just as I've done, as I've been writing this, look at yourself, please. Now, this is an Old Testament passage, I understand that, but that does not mean it is not applicable to the people of God today. Jesus said, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Let's not make the silly assumption that Jesus did not care about obedience, reverence, and respect. And that's what this part of Malachi is all about. 
Malachi 1.6, this is the ESV's version. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, or priests, who despise my name. I believe there's a spirit of regeneration today. Actually, over multiple generations. I don't know if you've ever come across the word zeitgeist before. People use it to talk about a set of ideals or beliefs that motivate the members of society in a particular time. So you can describe something that captures the feeling of how a generation feels, like a song or a film that really captures where people are right now as capturing the zeitgeist. It's interesting, the German word Zeitgeist is literally translated as time mind or time spirit. The term literally means the spirit of the age. Now I don't think it's been worded that way intentionally, but I think that word reveals what's really going on. Right across the Western world today, people are deceived by a mindset that has come from the pit of hell. It is a spirit of rebellion that rejects the authority, reverence, and sovereignty of God. And you don't have to look very far today to see that people have a problem with authority and submission in this world. You know, the baby boomers, they rejected the ideals and the authority of those who came before them. The generation who came before them were a generation who really had caught religion. They rejected it with this philosophy of just do what you want. Generation X rejected it too. Generation X got angry. They got angry at a system they felt had overlooked them. They wanted to break free from the chains that they felt they'd been put in. And now we are at the millennial generation, millennials. They've not so much rejected authority, but they've grown up in a world where it's never been respected and never really even existed for at least two generations. And the prevailing thought of the current generation is that there is no good or bad. All you can do is be true to yourself, whatever that means. Life is something that is to be experienced. And if somebody tells you that's wrong, then they are bad people. Because that's the only exception to the no good and bad rule, is someone who tells you something's wrong is bad. That has left an entire generation confused about its values and accepting things that should never, never have been acceptable. And this spirit, this line of thought, it's crept into church. And the church has done little to stop it. Some churches are still wondering what to do with baby boomers, let alone millennials. Some churches have just gone along with the flow in the name of relevance. It's a mindset that has grown and grown and today it affects every area of our society. There is a mistrust of authority on every single level of society. And the idea of a God who's going to tell you what to do, unacceptable. Films and media influence our thought, but you know what they also do? They do a good job of revealing how we think. They do a good job of revealing what the current thinking is. They tap into it. And you know this concept of a God who's in control? Well, you can see in so many films that God's a bad guy. He's the one in the wrong. Because limiting people's choice to do whatever they want is seen as wrong. Just to take a couple of examples, Prometheus is about a creator that doesn't care about his creation. The Truman Show is about an overseer that doesn't understand what it is we really need. The Northern Lights children's books by Philip Pullman have this idea that a God who controls is no longer relevant and therefore has to die. The new X-Men film proudly proclaims in its trailers that it's about people fighting against a God. And The World's End sums it up very well. In a conversation with this all-powerful being who's controlling humanity, this being called the network, Simon Pegg's character replies with this. Face it, 
We are the human race and we don't like being told what to do. What a line that sums up where we're at now. We are the human race and we don't like being told what to do. That captures the zeitgeist of where we are in the world today. How many times have you tried to stop somebody being disruptive in something and they've turned to you and gone, you can't tell me what to do. How many times? Has anyone ever been a teacher here? There's a few. How many people have heard that in a classroom? You can't tell me what to do. That is the mantra of a lost generation. I'll tell you the problem. It's both in the world and in the church. People want a saviour. But they don't want a lord. People are desperate, crying out for somebody to help them and save them. Life is so hard, they desperately want someone to break in and lift them from the depths that they're in. And when they hear of a saviour, when they hear about Jesus, one who can bring redemption, they want it. They want it so much. Then we tell them, Jesus died for you. Jesus loves you. That idea is appealing. But the idea that this saviour becomes your Lord, the boss, your master, that idea repels people. And what we've done is we've softened the gospel to Jesus loves you and all you need to do is accept him into your heart instead of saying you need to make him Lord in the hope that we get more hands up. Let me tell you, hands up without making Jesus Christ Lord means nothing. When many people respond to a call, they're accepting a saviour but they're not accepting a Lord. We want God Almighty rather than God Almighty. And the church has obliged. We've remade God in that image. That God is simply there to help us with our every whim, our every desire, without ever challenging us over our sin. We have sold people a Jesus whose sole purpose is to get them out of problems. We've got so lost. You cannot have Jesus as your saviour without making him Lord. It will not work and it will lead you disillusioned, disappointed and bored of the whole thing. You may even start to think, oh, you know what, I've been a Christian a little while, but this Jesus thing's not really working for me. That's kind of the point. Jesus isn't meant to work for you. You are meant to work for him. If Jesus is simply a means to an end for you, then you will always be dissatisfied with him because Jesus will not simply be a means to an end. He is the end. He is the goal. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He will not play second fiddle to your opinions or your desires. You know, when we're saved, we don't just say we believe in him. We believe he is what? We believe he's Lord. We believe he's Lord. Whoever believes Jesus Christ is Lord shall be saved. That means we submit to him as our master. But often we don't do it. Instead we think like this. Oh Jesus, I want to give you my life. Take my life. But not that bit. Jesus be my master, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to change that. Jesus be my saviour, but don't tell me what to do. Lord, I'm ready to serve you, but don't ask me to tithe. Or Lord, I'm tithing, don't ask me to serve. God, you have my wallet and my time but don't you dare ask for my sexuality. Lord, I'll read my Bible every day, but don't ask me to go to church on a bank holiday or a nice weekend. Lord, I'm so loyal to your church until they tell me something I don't like. <laughs> then I'll take my loyalty elsewhere. Lord, meet me on my terms. 
We're giving God half measures. Tell me you love me, but don't tell me to change. Respect, submission, and honor have gone out of the window. And God is saying to his people once again, if I'm your father, where's the honor? If I'm your master, where's the respect? Where's the fear? Where is the sense of awe at the presence of God? How can we treat Almighty God so casually? Jesus deserves more than a thank you for saving me. If he's Lord, where's the honor? Where's the sense of reverence before him? Just look at the world today. Allah gets more reverence and respect in this world than a demonic spirit. I mean, he's a demonic spirit. And he gets more respect than God. If people can revere a fraud, where's the respect of the Lord? Where's the submission to God? You know, there's so little submission in churches nowadays to leadership. And it's little surprise because we're not even submitting to him. What we do is we get offended and we're consumers. So we go somewhere else where we won't get offended. Acts 5 verse 31 said, God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Leader and savior. Let me shock you for a moment. This might, this might be a shock. The gospel is not you are a beautiful snowflake and Jesus just wants to be your best friend because you're so amazing. That's not the gospel. It's often told as the gospel. That is not the gospel. The gospel is you are fallen and lost and he is your only hope. Now it's good and true that we can say I am a friend of God. Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, now I call you friends. But in no way does that bring Jesus down to a lower level of respect and honor. Let me tell you, you are a friend of the King of Kings. You're a friend of the Lord of Lords. That is a different level of friendship than Joe Bloggs down the street. And you can't treat Jesus like your friendship's on that level. Just imagine for a moment that whatever circumstances makes this happen, I, d I have no idea how this would happen, but you made friends with the Queen. Let's just say, you managed to make good friends with the Queen. Does she ever stop being Queen, even though you were a friend? Would you ever disrespect her? Of course not. So why do we keep treating God like the friend we hope will never call? Like he's the friend who's always asking too much, so we try and keep out of his way. He's not your mate. He's not your buddy. Why not? Because you don't reveal your buddy. You're not lost in awe when it's your mate. I've seen Christians, serious Christians, wearing a t-shirt that says, Jesus is my homeboy. Seriously. Don't disrespect him. Don't treat him like he's ordinary. Jesus is not ordinary. He's not your homeboy. He's not a joke. He's not a funny slogan. He's King of Kings and he's Lord of Lords. We cannot have a casual attitude to Jesus. You see, we say Lord with our lips, but where's the action to go with what we say? Yes, he's called you friend, but he doesn't stop being your Lord. If he is your father, where's the honor? Where's the sense of reverence when you come to worship him? Where's the sense of placing him first above all things? See, first means above all else. When we come in here on a Sunday, do we come in all lazy, casual? doesn't matter, it's just church. Do we come just with this attitude of another Sunday? Or do we come prepared to meet the most wonderful, almighty creator who rules over all? Do we arrive on time? Or do we arrive just in time? Do we come in ready or do we come in hassled? 
with not enough time to prepare our hearts before him, to still our souls, to be ready to meet with him. When you focus, when you're in a meeting, where's your attention? Is it on him or your phone? If we're going to call him Lord, we need to make him Lord. And some of us, we've been happy to have a saviour. But we've not let Jesus tell us what to do. Some have never really made him Lord. They just wanted to be saved. We've wanted to be in his club, just as long as that club didn't have any rules. Some used to make him Lord. But now, it's just saying it. It needs to stop. It needs to stop today. If that's you, that needs to stop today. Just like in Malachi, God is calling us to the carpet. I love that turn of phrase. He's calling us to our knees in repentance. Will you give it all over to him? Will you cease to stop? No. Will you cease striving towards self-sufficiency? See, it seems to me we've fallen into the trap that Israel fell into. Their worship at the time, it wasn't serious. It was frivolous. It was probably quite enjoyable sometimes, even on a surface level. But you know, if church has just become another form of entertainment that we consume, and we don't really think about it much afterwards, we're in trouble. Malachi 1, verse 6 to 9, it says, But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals and sacrifice, is that not evil? When you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts. And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show any favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. See, God's saying here, you've despised me. And they've replied, how? And in the message, it puts it like this. Shoddy, sloppy worship. The ESV says polluted worship. By saying, coming together in worship, life in the church, growing in God together, by saying this stuff isn't important anymore, by saying this stuff doesn't need my best, that is defiling, polluting. Real, honest worship is gradually getting replaced with entertainment. I'm not saying you can't enjoy it, don't misunderstand me. But it's getting replaced with entertainment. We're losing the congregation and we're gaining a crowd, an audience, in a lot of places. If we just become an audience, we've missed the point of being here. Outreach has become the church trying to entertain people into the kingdom. As long as we put on a good show and get up a good speaker, some people will respond. We're actually told in part of our training as ministers to know our audience. Like outreach is a marketing exercise. Now I understand the need to know our audience, don't, don't get me wrong. But we don't pander to it. Because the audience doesn't know what it needs. We've let the world into the church in the hope that the world would change. But it hasn't. The church has changed. I was at a conference not too long ago, and uh, it's a big conference. And the band were playing a song in the background as people came in at the meeting. And I recognized this song. They were just playing the music, it didn't have the words in. And it was a song about staying up all night to get lucky. Essentially, it's a song about someone trying to sleep around completely inappropriate as you're leading into a time of worship. 
defiling, polluting. I'm not saying you can't listen to non-Christian music, but I'm telling you that place and that time is not the time for that. And the host for the meeting gets up and he gets everybody up in the room to dance to this song. A room full, hundreds of pastors and preachers dancing to this song. And I thought, I was sat next to Craig, and we, were both, we both looked at each other and were like, what is going on? We were just like, what on earth is happening? Now, I'm assuming that the guy hosting the meeting didn't know what the song was. That's no big deal. But you can't tell me the band didn't know what the song was. I've seen worship teams getting a meeting going with a song that's about sex just because it's got the word hallelujah in it. Let me tell you, they've twisted the word hallelujah in that song. Don't tell me any musician is that naive. Where's the reverence? Where's the honor? Where is the sense of awe before God? If coming to church was just about entertainment, then none of this would matter. But church is so concerned about being cool and awesome, it's forgetting to be holy. We are making the altar of God less important. Let me tell you, that's defiling. It's dishonorable. Israel was offering cheap sacrifices. They were giving God their second best. Sometimes they were even giving God their worst. It's only church. It doesn't matter. I'm too busy for this. It's, it's, I've got too much going on. This isn't important. This better be over quick. I've got things to do after this. Let me tell you, if you are too busy for God, you're too busy. Stop it. Step back and stop giving God second hands, cast off, cheap pound shop worship. When the worship of God is no longer important, that is defiling. That is not my words, that's God's words. Try that with your manager. The messenger uh, Bible uses the, uh, the term manager here, which I like because it brings it home and up to date. Try giving your boss that kind of commitment that you give to God. See how far that gets you. But manager isn't actually the term used in the other versions. It's governor. And the context for this was the Persian governor. And what was happening, Israel were giving the Persian governor all of the best stuff. Not that like they were keeping it for themselves. No, they were giving it to the Persian governor. And they were giving God what was left over. Let me tell you, God does not want your leftover time, devotion, energy or money. He wants your best. He does not want your scraps. God responded to their shoddy worship by saying, Get on your knees and pray I will be gracious. With this kind of conduct, do you think I'll pay attention to you? Or in the ESV, it says it like this. Let us entreat the favor of God that he might be gracious. With such a gift will he show favor. God, forgive us for defiling your altar. Lord, forgive us for your second best. For our second best. It has to change. It's got to change today. Cheap worship isn't worship. You know, the priests, they were no good. <laughs> they weren't helping. They didn't tackle any of this stuff. No, they just wanted to keep all the people happy so they get paid. So it went unchallenged. Malachi 2, I know we're skipping ahead a whole chapter, but it says this to the priests. Malachi 2, 7 to 9. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you a despised and a best before all the people, insomuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality 
in your instruction. See, the priests, they were just doing popular sermons. You know, the stuff that makes you feel good. You know, the kind of message, you're amazing. You're awesome. You just keep on doing what you're doing. Look at the way you're, that's, that, look at the way you're doing that. That's great. <laughs> that is great. You're listening really well. All right. that's, the kind of, that's the kind of stuff. You know, God, he just wants to love on you. He just wants you to be more awesome. It's time for you to reclaim your destiny. That kind of stuff. The, this is how God can make you prosper message. See, they were telling people what people wanted to hear rather than teaching the law of God. Look, I know this message is pretty hard. I know there's parts of this that seem brutal. But I have to say this, or I'm part of the problem. See, it's my job to preach the truth. And that sometimes means you've got to challenge some stuff. And when God's workers don't do that, they carry the responsibility for disobedience. You know, so far we've looked at respect. We've looked at reverence. We've looked at fear. And God wants to challenge some more stuff. Where is the commitment and the passion in his church? Now, don't get me wrong. Some churches, there's plenty of commitment and passion. But it's commitment and passion for the church, not for God. A commitment to a cause, a group, a need, being part of something, or just having an awesome time and Instagramming it. And that's about the extent of it all. If that's all we're about, it would be better if we didn't bother. You know, we can see in church so many hands go up, God save me, God save me. Genuine, God, I really want to give you my life. But where's the follow through? Where's the growth? You know, some people can go for years and years and never commit to anything beyond putting their hand up and coming forward for prayer every now and then. Now, part of this problem comes back to just plain making him Lord and doing what he says. Part of it, I think, is just plain hesitation. You don't feel ready to commit or ready to serve. If you've been saying, I'm not ready for a while now, let me just tell you, just so you're aware, you could be saying that the rest of your life if you're not careful. What is ready? The Holy Spirit's ready. If you've got the Holy Spirit, then you're ready. <laughs> Hesitancy needs to stop. Because what we are involved with is serious. This is not a game. And reluctance will hinder you right up until the moment where you make a choice for it not to. Don't say I'm not ready. Just be ready. God does not want our second best. Malachi 1.10, it says this. Or oh, that there was one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. In the message it says it like this. Why doesn't one of you just shut the temple doors and lock them? Then none of you can get in and play at religion with this silly, empty-headed worship. I am not pleased. The God of the angel armies is not pleased. And I don't want any more of this so-called worship. Let me tell you, God does not even want the second hand. He doesn't want the time you've got left after you've done everything else you need to do. He doesn't want the things you don't care about. He doesn't want reluctance from the people of God. I tell you what, some Christians are so reluctant to do anything for God. He doesn't want that. If you're going to do something reluctantly, don't bother. Don't bother. He wants a church that will commit to him. 
Oh, that we would be that church. He'd rather we shut the doors than play games. Now bear in mind, in context, he's talking about shutting the doors to the temple. Not just a church, the temple. The only place where you could offer sacrifices to God at the time. This isn't God sulking and saying, I'll tell you what, we'll close that church down and people can go start a new one that does it better. No, he's saying, shutting the temple, even though this temple didn't have the presence in it, was God saying, enough. I'm done. I don't want this. It's God saying, I'd rather there was no worship than second-hand, silly, empty-headed stuff. Because that stuff doesn't mean anything. If you're playing games, if your worship is about more enjoying it than glorifying God, he'd rather you didn't bother at all. He doesn't want that. He wants passion. He wants passion for him, not a good feeling in us. And so many worship songs today are nothing of the sort. They're about how God helps us, how God loves us, makes us feel all warm and fuzzy inside. Songs about how well we're doing by coming to church and singing songs. It's songs about, hey, we've won lots of battles in our lives. Isn't that great? That isn't worship. We should be singing about how amazing he is. That he is worthy of all of our passion. That he is the greatest, he is the highest. He is wonderful. He alone can rescue. He alone can save. We haven't done that one yet, hold on. <laughs> oh, have we? Okay. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds. Hold on. We did that one, did we? We're about to. You chose the cross, the perfect life, the perfect death. You cho That's worship. No, hey, Jesus, you make me feel good. God wants passion. He wants honor, and he wants commitment in our worship. You know, the Bible tells us not to forsake coming together. When Jesus described the church, he used that word ecclesia, as we heard last week, means assembly. You know, we used to think church was a building. We were wrong. It's the people. But here's what we've done. We auto-corrected that, but we auto-corrected it wrong, like an iPhone normally does. We said church is the people. And so what we've done is we've made it the people individually rather than corporately. But ecclesia means assemble. Let me tell you, you can't assemble by yourself. I don't know how you do that. So then we started to say, you know, church isn't just about Sundays. That's correct. But it includes coming together on a Sunday but what we did is we used that as a reason to minimize the importance of Sundays church isn't just Sundays church is seven days a week so I don't need to come on a Sunday uh, Sunday's part of the days of the week we've started to use it to minimize the importance of coming together like it's optional that's not what it was supposed to be see when you minimize the importance of this time isn't that defiling? Now, I'm not saying you should have 100% attendance or you're a bad Christian. Or even 90, is it 90% you need in schools now? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is if this is important, make it important. Let me bring you back to where we began. Don't make this about other people. But look at yourself. The world needs more than a savior. It needs a Lord. We cannot allow our attitude towards God to become lax, to become lazy, and to become casual. 
We cannot put ourselves in a position where the altar of the Lord does not matter to us anymore. We cannot allow what we think to be more important than what He has said. We cannot allow ourselves to forget who He is. We cannot allow our times of worship to become a formality or a chore, and we, we can't allow them to become about entertainment and feeling good. And it's happening all around us. No wonder the millennial generation finds it so hard. Generation X and the baby boomers have left a trail of ambiguity and disobedience in their wake. One generation said, why bother with God? The next one comes along and says, why bother to be good? The next says, there's no such thing as good or God. Where does that lead us? To a generation that says YOLO. You only live once. Let's experience everything now because nothing else matters. This might be an Old Testament passage, but it's very relevant. In fact, it's like looking at the church today when you read it. You can see how bad things were getting in Israel. You know, it was getting to such a state. People were abandoning their wives and trading them in for younger models. It's just a matter of course. What it meant was Jerusalem was filled with abandoned women and there was no welfare state to help them. The poverty amongst those abandoned women was terrible. And there was, the nation began to slide morally so far away from God and they found themselves in a state, such poverty on the streets of Jerusalem that they'd caused, but there was no government to blame, so they blamed God. They started to say, God doesn't care about us, so we don't care about him. They'd reached a stage where they simply just could not be bothered with God anymore. And I think looking at this nation at this time, you can see that. A church bereft of its power because it's let sin and compromise in. A church that cannot be bothered. And somehow, that's all God's fault. We may ask, how have we dishonored? How have we defiled? Through our shoddy, second-hand, pound shop devotion. Through giving him what's left in our lives, rather than the first. He is the God of heaven. He is the Lord of the angel armies. We can't treat him like a friend we only see sometimes and use as a doormat when it suits us. He is the amazing, awesome, heavenly creator. He is not your blogs. Everything that exists, he made. Not only that, he sustains it every second. Everything that's even here now without him couldn't hold itself together. He knows the hairs on your head and the thoughts inside it. He loves with a love you could never imagine. He is magnificent. And he's calling us to the carpet. I don't know where the message gets that turn of phrase from. I can't find it in any other translation. But you know what? I love it. It's a picture of repentance. It's so on the nose. He is calling us to repent. Not because he's mean, but because he wants to set us free. True freedom can only be found in him. When he has the right place in our lives, and that's up there, not down there. God is calling his church to the carpet. Actually, just for a moment. 
Just for a moment. Can we all close our eyes? Just for a moment. I'm not finished, but just for a moment. He's calling his church to repent. The reason I've asked you to close your eyes is this is a challenge to you, not the person sitting next to you. Is he more than your Savior? Is he your Lord? See, Jesus is either Lord of all, or he isn't Lord at all. That's easy to say. But it needs more than just saying. Jesus must be the saviour of your heart and the Lord of your life. We were once slaves to sin, but Christ has set us free to be slaves to righteousness. He is Lord and Master, and we are his slaves, like it or not. So he's calling us. I'm going to be quiet just for a moment. If God needs to say something to you, I'm just going to be quiet. He's calling us to deny ourselves. To take up our cross and to follow him. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. and follow him. Where is the fear and the reverence before God? If you don't have fear, a trembling when you consider him, he doesn't make you go weak at the knees. You haven't realized how huge he is. How awesome he is. How wonderful he is. Jesus said, there will be many who say, Lord, Lord, and he will say, I did not know you. You know why I think part of that reason will be? There will be many who say, Lord, without making him Lord. Making him Lord means giving him the primary place in your life. Give him all of the glory. Give him all of the honor. All of your life. Don't just call him Lord. Make him Lord. If you've given him parts of your life but not others, then today, right now, you need to give those things up. Anything you've had tightly a hold of needs to be let go. Because he doesn't accept anything less than everything. If it's less than everything, he doesn't want it. There needs to be repentance for second-hand devotion. Repentance for getting religion. 
Repentance for putting other things before God. God is asking us, will you make me first? Will I be your priority? He's tired of getting our second best. He doesn't want it. We need to repent for not caring for the lost like he does. For treating this time that we come to worship him as not important or something casual. Have you grown cold to God? Have you left your first love? He's calling you to the carpet. He wants our worship to be passionate. He wants our commitment. He wants us to be wholly devoted to Him. He will be revered. He will be respected. And He will be obeyed. Otherwise, we might as well shut the doors. Oh, Jesus. Lord, we come before you. Lord, we repent. I want to give you guys all freedom to do what you want. If you want to get on your knees, get on your knees. If you just want to sit there, sit there. I'm getting on my knees. Oh, Lord, we're sorry. We're sorry for making things about us. Even our relationship with you, Lord, we're sorry for putting the focus on us. You are Lord. You are holy. You are mighty. You are God. Oh, Lord, we give you honor. We give you glory. We give you praise. Lord, we give it all to you. We give it all to you, Lord. It seems harsh to say it's all or nothing. He really doesn't want part of you. I could be wrong here. Well, I just really felt God say, there's some people here and there's some stuff that you've always kept a hold of. I don't know what that stuff is. I think it varies. But there's some stuff you know what? Immediately we think of sin. That might be part of it, but that's not what God's put on my heart here. It's not sin. That's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a bad thing that you've kept a hold of. But you've still kept hold of it. You've not given it to him. Release it. Release it. He is Lord of all. Oh, he isn't Lord at all. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Jesus, we thank you that you are awesome. You are mighty. Lord, we come before you. We thank you for the cross, beloved. But we're more than thankful. We're more than just thankful. Today, Lord, let today 
be a a turning point. Let today be a turning point, Lord. Lord, we never want to defile our worship to you. We never want to make the altar of God less important. Lord, let today be a turning point in our hearts. Lord, I pray once we've turned, once we've repented, we'll never go back. You alone are worthy. You alone are worthy. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord.